Hey everybody, welcome back to Sensei Steve Says, hosted by Shaggy Doe Martial Arts. Today we're going to be talking about common effective targets for martial artists. Now before we get into that, I just want to put out a disclaimer, okay? Uh, we're going to be talking about some, uh, you know, anatomical effects that can happen to a person, um, some technique suggestions and stuff like that. The purpose of this video is to give you some information and kind of um, push into um, maybe a self-study on um, anatomy and how, you know, um, force in specific spots can cause to significant damage. And also to kind of give you a heads up of, oh, if you got hit here, these things are going to be, um, these are the things you can expect. They're going to be very um, painful and, and, you know, targets that you would generally aim for on somebody else if you're you were in a situation where your life depends on. With that being said, uh, I'm not telling you when to do any of these things. I'm not telling you how to do any of these things. That's something that you need to figure out for yourself. Um, consult maybe a legal professional on when you can do things. I know in New York, we have the statute for self-defense is Article 35 um, of the New York State Penal Code. I know that very well. Um, because of my position. Uh, it's something that I've studied quite thoroughly to know what I'm allowed to do and not allowed to do when I'm allowed to do it. Um, but I'm not a legal professional, so I'm not giving that advice out. And my suggestion is figure out what your state's rules are, figure out what your country's rules are, um, and you know, figure out where you can operate within that um, and what kind of situations call for different things. Some of the stuff that we're gonna talk about today causes permanent damage. Okay, and it can cause um, it can cause death. I mean, that is the the downside of the martial arts. My job is to keep myself safe, to keep you know my friends and family and loved ones safe, um, and that unfortunately might mean causing significant harm to another person because they made a poor choice and they made the choice that they were going to cause that kind of harm to me. Now, when, where, how these are moral implications. I'm not getting into that today. Um, that's something you got to figure out for yourself, but we're going to be talking about this. It's important um, to know what you can do, what you can't do in the eyes of the law of the land that you live in. All right. So with that being said, we're going to start um, with just a couple of easier ones. So we're going to start with the nose. Um, the nose is a great target. It sticks out. You can get at it from uh, three sides of the head easily. Um, from the back side of a person, you can come at it. Uh, it's a little bit harder, obviously, because you can't see it, but it's still a good target. A broken nose is going to be extremely painful. But um, your, your nose, if you don't know, is actually mostly cartilage. There's a little bit of your skull that comes out, um, but it's called the septal cartilage. And a lot of that is actually housed in uh, within your skull. If you look at a... Um, you know, an anatomical model or, you know, like the, the Shakespeare skull or something like that, there's a, a hollow space behind the nose hole that houses a lot of cartilage. Um, that's going to be um, the thing that we talk about breaking. So a punch or a technique that comes straight into the face, straight into the nose is going to do uh, a lot of damage because that's all cartilage. It's not necessarily bone. So you're talking about um, potentially uh, doing damage to the angular portion of the nasal vein, all right? That's why it bleeds so much. You, it's, there's actually a vein um, in your nose here that is pretty close to the surface. It's why, you know, if it's dry weather, some people are susceptible to nosebleeds. Why nosebleeds are so difficult to stop? Um, it's because there's a lot of blood that runs through there, and it's pretty fragile. Um, when you get hit in the nose, one of the, uh, the reactions that your body has is it causes your eyes to water. So a solid shot to the nose is going to cause basically temporary blindness um, or blurred vision at the very least because what's going to happen is your eyes are just going to flush. Um, part of that is to uh, because they're all right next to each other. Uh, and part of that is I'm sure your body trying to make sure that there's, you're keeping blood out of your eyes because Water in your eyes, sweat in your eyes, it burns, but you can see through it. Blood, you can't see through um, if it gets in your eyes. Um, it's actually very difficult to see through. So 
Uh, I don't know for sure if that's a, a reason for it, but I know that it's helpful to get that blood out of your eyes. Um, the, the old adage of, oh, you can like hit somebody's nose up into the brain and they could die. That is technically true. It's a lot more difficult than a lot of people, I think, uh, put their mind to. There is a, um, basically a, a, a membrane between the back of the nose and the bottom of the brain. Uh, and if you hit things at certain angles, you can cause that, uh, you can cause the, the cartilage to go and perforate that membrane. Um, which causes, you know, obviously hemorrhaging in the brain, which is bad. Um, with that being said, though, it, I think that's harder than a lot of people give it credit for. There's actually a specific angle that I'm not going to get into for that to be a possibility. Um, and generally, I mean, it is you, your, your goal, even in a self-defense situation, um, you have to think about, is it worth trying something that's a maybe? Um, you know, if, if you're trying to debilitate somebody, there are much surer bets than that. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about is the tip of the mandible right here, the bottom of the jaw here. Um, this one's going to be based on the, the neck muscle of your opponent. Okay. Um, the stronger they are in their neck, the less this is going to affect them. Okay. Because they'll be able to hold steady. But basically what happens if, if you take a punch up and in, uh, on your jaw at a nice 45 degree angle, what's going to happen is there, a shock wave goes up and through and it starts hitting all the stuff in the back of your brain that you really, really need. So it's, it's, um, one of the knockout spots, um, taking a straight punch. That's why uppercuts are a thing. Uh, it can cause significant dental damage. Um, and you know, it can cause a concussion. It can cause knockout. Um, that's a good one. It's nice and easy to get at. The problem with it is it's a hard, uh, your jaw is very, very hard. So if you punch somebody in the jaw, the chances of you breaking your hand are actually pretty high. It's like punching a cinder block. Uh, not like the ones you break for, for tournament, whatever, the patio blocks. I'm talking like a cinder block with like parts uh, or reinforcement bits and stuff in it. You punch something like that, you're probably going to break your hand. Right. There are, yes, there are people that train really hard so they don't break their hand when they do stuff like that. But not everybody do that, does that. And in fact, most people don't. So train, you know, expecting to be able to break somebody's jaw like that with a closed fist is, is kind of folly unless you specifically train for it. Uh, my suggestion would be palm heel. Um, palm heel is uh, a softer, there's more padding on your hand. The chance of you breaking your uh, your hand is much lower. Palm heels are nice and easy or an elbow. Taking an elbow to the jaw um, is probably going to put them down. Um, that's also going to help you overcome some of their neck muscles. So it does happen, if it does happen to be a bigger guy, stronger guy, um, the chances of you being able to overcome that and still, you know, rattle him um, are higher. The next one is the brachial plexus. So the brachial plexus is actually uh, a group of five nerves that run right on the back of your traps. Now, from the front, there's not a lot you can do to get at that one, but from the side and the back, you can actually get at it pretty easily. Um, in Ishinru, we do actually a couple of uh, kata that would do, um, you know, target that. So if you do the open hand block hammer fist from Chinto can easily be an open hand block to the backside of an arm to come in with a hammer fist to that. Uh, also, uh, there's a brachial stun. So if you come down and you basically just do two hammer fists right to the top of somebody's traps right here and drive through, you want to put all that energy through them, your knees are going to buckle um, because you're hitting the brachial plexus. You're actually hitting them on both sides. Um, their knees are going to buckle. Uh, and if you do it uh, with enough force compared to their muscular strength and, and whatever, you can actually knock somebody out with that. They'll pass out when they hit the ground. Um, I've seen it. It's temporary. It's not something that's going to last a long time, but if somebody's falling asleep on the floor, I can run really fast, right? Um, that one can cause um, temporary paralysis of an arm, right? So if you smash that real good, it's also the same nerves that come right up in between the bicep and the tricep on the arm. So just like hitting that might cause their arm to go numb where they can't move, 
you know, they're, they're elbowing their fingers properly. If I go a little bit higher, they won't be able to necessarily move their shoulder properly either. Um, that can be a lot of help. It's a lot easier to fight a guy with one arm um, or girl. You know, they might be attacking you. But it gives you, um, you know, something you can take tools away from them. Now, in a sparring match, um, you can go, depending on the rule set. So in uh, contact fighting, where leg kicks and arm kicks are acceptable, you can totally start taking somebody's tools away from them by going after those nerves, causing the temporary paralysis, and making it so that they can't, you know, muster a good guard. You know, it's, when you blast somebody's arm enough times and their guard gets dropped down to here because they just don't have the strength to get it back up, right? Um, that's, that's all part of the same thing, right? You start shocking those nerves and it kind of causes like a static, right? Where you, you can't, your brain can't send signals through it as well. You get that little staticky feel and you can't move it as well as you want to. Um, but that one's very effective. That one's also very effective if there's a, a, like two on one combat. So if somebody's, you know, if and I will, I'll call it just a random self defense situation. Somebody's beating up somebody else. Uh, if you're trying to save the victim of that, the you can go after the aggressor and come down behind them. That's incredibly effective um, to do something like that. Uh, the next one in the same area is Adam's apple for guys or generally the throat for anybody. Um, Punching somebody in the throat is incredibly effective. Uh, obviously, this is going to be based on the neck muscles and the strength of the person that you're punching. But the uh, your trachea sits in the front of your throat, and it's more or less unguarded because it has to be. In order for you to move your head around and still be able to breathe, that has to be at the front. Uh, it's just how your body was built. So if you strike that, you can make them uh, have significant difficult breathe, uh, difficulty breathing. Um, if you strike it hard enough, you can cause some hemorrhaging um, or bleeding, um, which would require uh, a doctor or hospital to help, help take care of. Um, you can make it almost impossible for them to breathe or you need, um, you know, because it starts swelling because it's broken and, and such, um, which would require, you know, somebody to be intubated to be to continue breathing. Um, so that one's very effective. Um, the Adam's apple is a little easier to target for guys um, just because you can see it and it's a little more fragile. It's gonna, um, if you think of your trachea as like a vacuum cleaner hose, it's actually very similar uh, in construction and durability. You can bend it and fold it and do a lot of stuff with it. Um, if you smash it with a, with like a, if you took a, a vacuum cleaner hose and smash it with a hammer, Generally, what's going to happen is it'll break uh, like a straw, where it'll break sideways and it'll let it'll be like a fibrous break. So if you if you think about a green stick, if you take a green stick and you start breaking it back and forth, you get all these little fibers and stuff. The stick won't break, but it'll start bending more. Um, you'll start getting breaks like that on your trachea, um, which is very very dangerous. It's not going to be an immediate. Um, uh, death, but it is going to be something that is incredibly painful. It's going to take the fight out of somebody. Eyes. Uh, we talked about this a little bit with one of my blast self-defense videos. Uh, eyes are incredibly potent targets, and a lot of people don't want to think about eyes. Um, and you know, they are the the possibility for permanent damage is really high for these. So when you're practicing. It's, you have to be super careful. Um, you, I mean, it, think about getting poked in the eye. It's incredibly painful. It's, uh, it causes temporary or permanent blindness. It's a, a, a reaction of your body to get poked in the eye and you kind of hunch back in and go like this until you can figure out what's in your eye. Um, you know, if you ever think about, like if you were uh, riding your bike, you get a bug that hits you in the eye. A lot of people crash because they're so concerned about that bug in their eye that they forget everything else that's going on. Uh, in a fight, if you get, you know, somebody uh, scratches your eye or pokes you in the eye um, or anything like that, that, that pain is going to be instantaneous and debilitating. Um, it's also going to directly impact your ability to continue fighting back. So eyes are an incredibly important target. Um, 
And just to, to put things also in perspective, like for Sifu, Sifu wears glasses. If somebody's wearing glasses, depending on how bad their prescription is, just taking their glasses, you know, out of the picture, whether they get knocked off or punched off or broken or whatever, that's going to affect their ability to see you and to react to you. Okay. So if somebody's, um, doing stuff like that, contacts are the same thing. If you take a good shot in the head, the chances of your contacts flying out are actually pretty high. That's going to take their ability to see you uh, and make their decisions based on that um, a lot more difficult. Um, ears are another good one. Um, ears are both pain; they're painful if you strike them. Um, you, if you can, um, if you puncture the the eardrum, that's going to directly affect your ability to hear. It's incredibly painful. Um, and also, uh, your ears actually house uh, all the tools that you need for your sense of balance. So if you take a, a cupped hand and you clap somebody in the ear where it pushes that pressure difference in there, um, you know, that is both debilitating because it causes incre incredible disorientation, right? It, imagine being immediately dizzy. Um, but also it's very painful. Think about like if you're on a plane ride or you're going up and down a hill, you have to like swallow to get your ears to pop because it's, it's uncomfortable. Now, if that happens immediately, that, that pain is going to be pretty extreme. Um, next is going to be, uh, the solar plex. Solar plexus is one of, uh, the primary targets of, of, uh, karate in general. But if you find your sternum, which is this hard bone in the middle of your chest, and you follow it to the bottom, about an inch below the bottom, you'll if you poke it, you'll immediately feel there's a kind of a void in your abdominal muscles. Um, that's called your solar plex. Your solar plexus is uh, a bundle of nerves that controls your diaphragm. Now, on uh, the way that your lungs work is in your rib cage, you have a diaphragm that comes up underneath it. And then you have your lungs. So the diaphragm is the part that moves. And as it comes down, your lungs inflate. As it comes up, your lungs deflate. And that is also controlled by your ancillary muscles between your rib cage. Uh, that diaphragm is the part that's pulling and pushing together. There's no muscle in your lungs themselves. They're just literally, uh, uh, if you think of them like a balloon, the balloon can't open itself. But if you put a balloon in a vacuum chamber, it will open itself, right? So if basically you, the vacuum is causing the balloon to change shape, it, your diaphragm uh, causes your lungs to change shape. If you s hit the solar plex, what it does is it stuns the diaphragm. So it sits there and it, was, it, it can't function like it wants to um, because it's, it's stunned. So it will prevent, basically prevents you from breathing for, for a period of time. Now, uh, Having had the wind knocked out of me in a fight, is it overcomable? Absolutely. If you get punched in the solar plexus, can you make it through it? Yes, absolutely. It's not comfortable. It's not fun. It will absolutely hamper your ability to fight, um, but it won't necessarily stop you. Um, so that's important to remember. Um, you can cause significant damage. And think about it. Anytime you've had the wind knocked out of you, you know, you sit there and you get one of those... <coughs> sounds where you're sitting there trying to get air in and you just can't because you know you got to let your diaphragm relax and start functioning properly again that takes time time you don't necessarily have in a fight and again if my primary goal is to get out of there to get to 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 get out of the situation um you know i can run faster than somebody who can't breathe that's not super difficult um you know i can run in a direction if somebody can't see me i can uh, if somebody can't stand up because they're so dizzy, I can run a lot faster than them. You know, these are things that I'm not necessarily taking the fight until they hit the ground and they stop moving. I'm taking the fight until I can leave, right? In New York State, as I said, that Article 35, I know what it says. And it says that I have a duty as a civilian to retreat, okay? Which means that uh, if somebody attacks me, I can defend myself, yes. But as soon as I have the ability to leave, I need to. So if that's one punch and now I can run faster than, you know, I, I punch him in the throat or something and now I start running away, 
uh, if they're not following me, I don't get to stand there and beat the snot out of them. You know, that's my one punch, right? That's what I get. Now, obviously, if my one technique isn't successful and they keep trying to come after me, I can do more. Um, but generally, the karate I use is, is enough to get away. Um, I'm not going to get into that right now. There's obviously a lot to unpack in that, but um, just to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, groin. Groin's a great target. Um, everybody thinks about it, um, but there's some there's some parts to it that you kind of have. You, not everybody thinks about. One, uh, kicking somebody in the groin works for guys and girls. Okay, it's a very uh, there's a lot of nerve endings for everybody, um, all in about the same spot. So everybody's like, oh, it'll hurt a guy more. Well, it hurts a guy. Yes, trust me, I can speak from experience. Uh, it definitely hurts. However, it hurts everybody. Um, additionally, uh, if you have a skilled opponent, somebody who's trained, somebody who's been in a lot of fights, not necessarily professionally trained, but like they, they grew up on the street kind of thing, they, they've been in fights and fights and fights. If you've taken those kicks a couple times, your punches or whatever, if you've been hitting the groin a couple times, you can fight through that pain. It's definitely a pain that you recognize and can fight through. Uh, it sucks. Like, don't get me wrong. It's going to, it just like getting punched in the throat. It's going to, or your wind get knocked out of you or anything. It's something that you can function through if you are training, right? If you're training to, to get to that point where you're stronger and stronger, it's something that you can function through, but it's not going to, you know, you won't be at your hundred percent best. Um, so kicking somebody in the groin might be less effective in terms of like actually kicking them in the genitals. However, um, a usually overlooked fact is that a solid technique to um, the pelvic bone, which is just above the genitals, uh, is absolutely debilitating. Uh, if you can, it's, if you think about your, your hips, right? You've got the big cups on your hips where your, your femur goes, Right, that gives you the ability to walk. And there's this little bone that connects both sides of those in the front. If you break that, that's your pelvic bone. If you break that connection, uh, they can't walk anymore. All right, unless they're on some crazy drugs that keep them from feeling pain. But physically, uh, their ability to move at all is going to be significantly hampered. That's a very serious injury. Um, there's a lot of dangerous stuff all in through there. So if they you know, if they try to run after you, the chances of them, um, you know, perforating something that they can't fix anymore uh, is actually pretty high. But if you break that, the chances of them actually being able to run after you are almost zero. Um, so uh, my suggestion is to kick just a little bit higher. Uh, if you aim for that instead of just the groin, um, so instead of maybe an elevator kick, changing it to a front kick, uh, the chances of you... Uh, keeping it so that they absolutely cannot chase you um, so that you have the time to leave and get other people out of there or whatever it is you got to do is is very effective. Uh, the last one we're going to talk about today is the knees. Uh, getting kicked in the knees, uh, as far as, you know, young guys and girls, uh, trust me when I tell you your knees will go bad on you at some point. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Uh, I am in my 30s and I can tell you uh, having been kicked in the knees, that it will happen to me sooner than later, uh, I already know. I've spoken to a lot of people. Uh, obviously, is a number. The two biggest complaints of people as you get older are my knees hurt, my back hurts. So uh, your knees will go bad if you kick somebody in the knees. The chances of them uh, being able to run after you are very slow. Uh, your knees are very fragile joints. Uh, if you kick them backwards or to the side, you're going to do. Uh, extreme damage. Um, surgery can usually put stuff back together. You can you can replace knees um, with titanium joints, but uh, that doesn't. They're not running after you anytime soon, um, and that's kind of important. Uh, it's going to literally limit their ability to walk or stand immediately. So um, this is important to think about when you're doing sparring, right? So if you're sparring with contact and leg kicks are allowed, you have to be very careful about where you're kicking. Kicking somebody in the quad is fine, so, or the, the quad or the hamstring and the side of the leg, those are all good targets. Kicking somebody in the calf is a good target, but kicking somebody in the knee, uh, you, you're, 
asking for trouble. Um, so if you are sparring and stuff, another side of, of learning about all these targets is if you are trying not to hurt your opponent, right, because it's a game, sparring's a game, uh, you really don't want to be aiming at any of these, okay? And you want to be very careful, in fact, that you're not aiming at these. That's why for Ishinru, um, you know, you can't even aim at the spine when you're sparring um, because the potential for damage is just so high. A couple of the, the targets that have the highest potential of damage, I've left out of this discussion completely just because I don't want people, um, you know, I was a kid once and I remember, oh, if I hit you here and this will happen and that will happen and all these other things, I, oh, I'll smash you in this place and then, you know, whatever. Uh, that's not where I'm going. I'm going more for the just the basic instruction, all right? So for my students, you guys all know, all right, these things are important to know where they are because it's important to know how to protect yours, right? And it's also important to know um, where your opponent's targets are. On a little bit of a brighter note, we'll get into some announcements um, because that brings us to the, the end of the targets that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, our June 30 and 30 challenge ends tomorrow. Today's the 30th, so uh, I'm going to start getting those calendars in, I hope, and we'll announce who gets the sweet limited edition uh, Mizugami t-shirt. Our Zoom class is going to continue. Um, this week we're doing our uh, Zoom class in the park, so if you want to come join us for that, um, that will be awesome. Other than that, uh, you know, as we you know, figure out more regulations and restrictions about how we're going to be uh, further impacted by COVID. I will obviously uh, let all you guys know, but uh, keep on getting after it. Keep up with your training. You know, you can uh, stay strong, stay working out. Calisthenics, you don't need equipment for. So you can do push-ups and sit-ups anywhere. All right. So make sure you guys are getting after it. Get those, get your strength on. You guys are dismissed. <laughs>